Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Mark Glusky with us. Um, he's just written a book, <coughs> Faster, Higher, Stronger. Um, yeah, people around here like books like this because it looks a little <laughs> bit like Ben Horowitz's I know, book. Right? That I, is, I mean, there's nothing, and I don't want to say anything, but this no, sold pretty I, well. And, uh, well, let's hope, let's hope it helps. <laughs> we'll take all the help we can get on color scheme. Yeah. So, yeah, so, so um, uh, you're an editor at Wired, um, but have also been a journalist at a number of, uh, of sports concepts. Can you, you know, give, it, give a brief uh, sure. career of the career trajectory and how you came to write the book? Um, so my joke is this is bringing together the... Um, I'm trying to bridge the nerd jock divide here. Uh, okay. uh, I started my career at Sports Illustrated, where I covered baseball and college football, and um, helped launch SI's first website way back when people were launching their first websites. Yeah. Um, and worked there for a while, and then moved out here, worked at Electronic Arts, where I launched some editorial products there, and have been at Wired for nine years. So it's really you know, I grew up wanting to be a sports writer, and now I'm a technology editor. And, so. and that, so the, you just go back and forth back between and the forth, nerd and yes. the, uh, which is great. Yeah. Um, so the premise of the book is that there's been massive improvement in athletic performance due to our better understanding of our body and how they can be trained, as best I can tell. So, you know, it's hacking your body. It is. You know, we, over the past hundred years, our performance, if you look at things like um, the 100 meter freestyle, uh, we're 49% faster than we were in 1909. Um, some women's field events are actually, we've had more than 100% performance improvement in those events. What's interesting is that curve's starting to flatten out a little bit, yeah. that, that we've had this century of unbelievable physical achievement. And a lot of that comes from just really understanding some of the basic science in ways that we never knew it before. N now, and I, th I think one of the points I try and really illuminate in the book is to find sort of marginal gains over your competition, you have to look much deeper. You have to look towards science and technology and towards not just doing the basics right, which is in still incredibly important and surprisingly gets wrong a lot of the time, yeah. Yeah. even at the elite level, but, but really finding those, those little improvements through really sort of cutting edge crazy techniques. Yeah, you've got, you've got a line that I thought was interesting and somewhat depressing. Today's great innovations are tomorrow's baseline. So, you know, you, you know the, the ante for athletic performance keeps, keeps going up, but then you're still competing. You're competing now with everyone who's, yeah. I mean, if you look at, if you watch game tape of, like, an NBA game from the 50s or 60s, if you watch the Celtics from the 60s, who many people acknowledge as, like, the greatest team ever. It's hysterical. It's hysterical. Yeah. You see these guys taking sort of like 15-foot hook shots and like just sort of like set shots. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know. <laughs> look, look if you can, look if you can make the, if you can if you can consistently make a 15-foot hook shot, that's amazing. But um, he, he just fell off with the consistent. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. So we have some yeah, hoops yeah, players. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have a few. Yeah. Um, it's just such a different universe that, that we're yeah. competing in now. And, and yeah, it's just that ante goes up a little bit every year. And, and once you stack year over year, it's, you know, it's the same thing that we all face in all the things that we do business-wise, right? That, yeah. you know, if, if, we could go, if we could morph ourselves back to 1996 and launch a website, we'd be in pretty good shape, right? Because we've learned a whole lot. But yeah. you know, at the time, it seemed like, you know, yeah, yeah, that was, things were pretty cool. What we yeah. were doing, now we'd laugh at they, it. They were fast. It was high-paced. Yeah, um, exactly. uh, nature versus nurture. Can anyone uh, be a, train themselves to be a world class athlete? No. Could I do it? No. No. I, think, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's. I, I, mean, clear. I mean, I mean, <laughs> nature versus nurture is this never ending debate in in science, yeah. and we love the narrative that anybody can do anything because it. It, we want to believe that, and we want to encourage our kids that they can be or do anything they want. When it comes to elite athletic performance, there's really there's this tension. There's a certain level of genetic endowment that you have to have, and, and without that, you're not going to be competitive at the elite level. Like this, this level is so far beyond normal. This isn't about just sort of like being a good runner or being a decent golfer. You know, I'm I'm an okay golfer and. Somebody who's a scratch golfer looks at me like I'm a joke, right? So multiply that by like 20, and you're at the worst player on the PGA Tour. And multiply yeah. that by another 20, and you're at the best player on the yeah. PGA Tour. You, one, uh, one biologist talks about genetics as the size of the bucket that you possess, and work, and, and training as how high you fill that bucket. So. 
the best genetics don't always win, but they're sort of the cost of entry. Yeah. And conversely, can anyone be a world-class athlete without these days without you know these, using these training techniques? I think it's really hard to be. I mean, I, th I think I think it's probably easier to be a world-class athlete with great genetics and bad training than it is to be a world-class athlete with bad genetics and great training, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, which is there. So, um, so starting to are, are great athletes born? You have, you, have, you have some interesting examples in the book of, uh, of where genetics seem, uh, seem uh, pretty powerful. Yeah, it's, genetics seem to make the most difference in sports that are really physiologically determined. So, so running, cycling, rowing, th things that really there are tactics and there is training, but a lot of it comes down to sort of how much oxygen you can process and how your muscles work. Um, team sports, things that require a lot of skill, seem to sort of border more on on the training side. But there's always a balance there. But, you know, to use Gladwell's phrase, these guys are outliers, but there are people who have won world championships in the high jump three years after they high jumped for the first time. You know that's yeah. that's crazy. That is crazy. That, that's that, that's insane. Beating thousands of people who've spent their whole life doing this. There are people who won Olympic rowing gold medals two years after sitting in a boat for the first time. They were great athletes in other sports, and there have been really cool things that the UK has done, especially to try and find athletes in other sports and put them in a sport that's better suited to their athletic abilities and talents. Des describe that. I, I, lo I, lo I enjoy so, that. Yeah. So Helen. Um, Helen Glover is this woman's name. She was a field hockey player in the UK, and she was a good field hockey player, but not a great one. The UK, in the run-up to the London Olympics, ran a program, and I love the name of it, it was called Sporting Giants. And um, what they did is they put out a call for tall athletes. Um, height's a real advantage in some sports, and one of them is rowing, because basically you're a lever. Like, the <coughs> physics of it is just a longer lever's better, all, all other things being equal. Yeah. Uh, so she saw new, her mom actually saw a newspaper advertisement for this um, for this program. She went, she interviewed. They did sort of an initial screen, then they did physiological testing on about a thousand athletes, male and female. Uh, a couple hundred went into a training program, and yeah, three years later, she won a gold medal in London with her her partner Heather Standing in the pairs uh, pairs rowing, which is you know kind of cool. Uh, Bob Sleds had a few of those too. Where Bob, they, Herschel Walker, I think. Herschel yeah, Walker yeah, was yeah. Uh, Lolo Jones, who was yeah. a, a yeah. sprinter, uh, was in the bobsled. Lauren Williams, another sprinter. Yeah, some of those things like a bobsled push athlete, you know. You run and push. It's not. There's not a lot of skill. Right. The driver, on the other hand, spends it's, decades honing his or her craft, yeah. trying to figure out how to get that thing done. But then, then flipping back to genetics, the two two winners of the New York Marathon this year again were Kenyan. So you know, sure. What what happens in East Africa? That is a great. I mean, <laughs> if, if if I could answer that question, I. Um, so I think people can conflate genetics with other things. Um, so there are things genetically, they're genetically determined like body size and height that East African runners tend to have. Um, they're, they're pretty small. Yep. They, um, they have really thin calves. There have been some interesting research on the, the one thing in running is obviously how fast you can swing your legs and how much energy that takes. And, and the lighter the leg, the better. That's why Oscar Pistorius was actually able to be competitive because yeah. he had a very light leg. Yep. I mean, because it was yep. made out of carbon yep. fiber. Yep. Um, but there are other factors. The, the fact that the Rift Valley sits at over 2,000 meters of altitude. Yep. And so everybody's living at high altitude. We spend people move all over the U.S. to live at altitude and train. The fact that there's a culture that really values running as not just a mode of transportation, but as sort of like the highest athletic aspiration. It's, it's the equivalent of you know, making it to the NFL or NBA or Major League Baseball in the States. And the fact that you really have a, a culture that has, has developed around identifying good runners young and starting to train them. Yeah. Um, and, and frankly, some of the things we've seen is, is perhaps a culture that's willing to cut some corners when it comes to pharmacology. Um, yep. you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to we'll that come time back to again. That yeah, time. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, because there has to be hope for me. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we augmented. So, you know, I think everybody wants to find a, a really simple answer to that yeah. question. You know, if we'd been having this conversation in the 1930s, you would have said, like, why do Finnish runners win yeah. every middle distance event? You know, Finns dominated basically from the 800 to the 10,000 meters for 40 years. Like, things like 
the top seven in the Olympics, four of them were Finns. And, yeah. and everybody's like, why the yeah. Finns? You know, like, I don't think we think that Finns had some genetic advantage. Right. Right. I, I think, frankly, we, we, we look for these just-so stories, and it's, just, it's a much more complicated yeah. question. Than no, that. which is interesting. Okay, switching over to training. Um, what you describe in the book as, as you know, some of the state-of-the-art training now is unrecognizable to <laughs> me. I mean, talk, talk about what some of, the, some of the, the pro athletes now. Sure. So I spent some time um, actually just down the road here. Um, there's a guy named Phil Wagner who runs a gym called Sparta Sports Science, uh, and he works with um, – he started working with a lot of baseball players. He also worked a lot with Jeremy Lin um, before Lin Sanity. He sort of rebuilt yeah. Jeremy as an athlete. Phil has sort of two key things that he works on. One is like a, a very regimented way of evaluating athletic ability, and he does it with force plate analysis. So there's there's a lot of literature that just doing a vertical jump on a force plate, you can tell a lot about somebody's movement patterns. Um, there are sort of three factors. It's how quickly you can move, how long you can sustain a movement, and how much power you generate. Um, Different sports ask for different things, right? We, 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 we think of athleticism or athletic ability as sort of this global thing, and it's completely not. You, you look at, you know, an NFL lineman and Lionel Messi and put them up against each right. other, and, like, those, you know, they barely look like the same species, let alone people yeah. who would compete with one yeah. another. Yeah. So, so one of the real frontiers is that match between your personal athletic ability, the event that you want to get better at. So, you know, when Phil tested me, he's, you know, you, you get this graph, and he's like, okay, well, what do you want to do? Right. Well, when, yeah. I'm like, well, well weightlifting. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's probably not my forte, right? <laughs> um, you know, so I've been playing a lot of golf. He's like, okay, well, then, you know, that's very rotational. You need to, and, and in his movement signature, what you need is a longer drive. You need to be able to sustain force as long as possible through that motion. And I'm pretty poor at that, it turns out, which yeah. may, explains a lot, perhaps. <laughs> um, he, so, you know, so he would prescribe one set of training methods if that's what I wanted to do. If I wanted to play wide receiver, he'd prescribe something that worked on my straight line speed, which actually I'm not bad at. And, right. you know, so with, with a set of exercises. With a set of exercises, for, with yeah. different lifts, yeah. with focusing on different sort of biomechanical chains in the body, sort yeah. of like lateral or posterior or anterior. And so yeah. you sort of, it's... It, it, it's really, it's that level of scientific focus. It's not, it, it's so far beyond, not just like go run. It's not yeah. even just like go, go run li- intervals. Not go lift, not right. go stretch. It's, it's, yeah. it's okay. You know, I, I got a chance to meet Ashton Eaton, who's the world record holder in the decathlon for this book. And we actually went for a run, and we ran like two miles. And it's the longest run he'd done in five years. There's no reason for him to ever run more than two miles. He, the longest thing he ever runs in yeah. competition is 1,500 meters, yeah. right? Yeah. So, you know, it, it was, but it was just one of those funny moments. It's like, oh, like, I've run more than <coughs> distance than you do yeah. when I go for a run because, like, we're not training to do the same thing. Right. right. Then you had this great phrase for British cycling, the, the ag- performance by the aggregation of a whole bunch of incremental gains. You know, it's a performance Ag- by aggregation of marginal yes. gains. So British cycling... Um, is kind of this amazing sports science success story. British cycling sucked forever. They were terrible. They were a laughing stock. Um, and, and it kind of was embarrassing to them. They didn't like it. And about 15 years ago, um, the UK started a nationwide lottery. And one of the things that they do with the lottery money is they give millions and millions of dollars to high performance sport funding and research. So they came upon this huge pile of money and tried to figure out what to do with it. And a couple of people, a guy named David Railsford, ran British Cycling for about a decade. And that's his phrase, performance by the aggregation of marginal gains. And the idea is there aren't any magic bullets anymore, that we've made all the big leaps in performance that we're going to make physically. And that the only way to really find a competitive advantage now is to find lots and lots of little tiny improvements over dozens of things. And so some examples, um, they, before the Olympics, they spent a lot of time with Adidas and some university researchers, track cyclists. They do a warm-up, and then they go to a holding area before the race. And 
the temperature in the muscle starts to drop as you sit there waiting for your race, and that's not good. So they developed what they called hot pants, which I love that they called them hot pants. Um, heated heated tracksuit bottoms, basically, that had heating elements over the thighs and, and, and hamstrings to keep the muscle warm between the warm-up and the race. Um, they travel with their own pillows. Um, most of us have probably had the experience of sleeping on a bad hotel pillow and waking up, your necks hurts. And that's annoying for us. Like the day before the Olympic final, that's a huge problem, right? Yeah. So you travel with your own pillow. Also, it helps you not get sick. Eight yeah, right, right, right. Eight percent of athletes who competed in London got sick during the Olympics. And that's that's got to be a bummer. That's a bummer, right? Yeah. You, 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 <laughs> yeah. you catch a cold the day before yeah. your race. It's like, okay, yeah. well, yeah. You know, so when you talk to the, these athletes, they won't shake your hand because yeah. God only knows where my hands are. Right, right, right. So, right. Um, so it's really Being about yeah. yeah. It's 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 really about trying to to find little improvements before every race. They spray isopropyl alcohol on the tires and wipe them down. Just make sure there's no dust on the tires, so they get you know, maybe it's a thousandth of a second, maybe yeah. it's nothing, but it can't hurt. And then now it's got it's in the book you talk about. It's gotten to the point where there's a cult around. Almost the, you know it, uh, people are. You know, willing to ascribe benefits to the British training approach that, that might not even be there. The, during the Olympics, the, the French, there's a great rivalry, obviously, and especially in track cycling, and they were killing the French. They, and the French were complaining, and they were saying, like, you know, it's really weird. Like, after every race, like, they, they take their bikes and they, they cover the wheels up really quickly. Like, what's up with the wheels? Is there something? What are they hiding from the wheels? And the Le Keep, which is the French sports daily newspaper, went and asked Brailsford. He's like, yeah, well, they're especially round. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and so the, the headline in L'Equipe the next day was like, um, Magic or Mavic. Mavic is the French company that makes their wheels. Yeah. And, and they were speculating that perhaps they were especially round wheels. Yeah, they were, yeah. yeah. Um, which, you know, if you believe that they can make a more perfect circle. And that's, yeah, yeah, in France? No, yeah, no, yeah. That, that, no, sorry. It's a... Uh, so um, uh, get back to the concept of uh, sport-specific training. Um, mm-hmm. you, you talk. You have some fun exa- examples of uh, the hammer or the uh, or the um, uh, uh, volleyball team. Yeah. So we don't practice very smartly in most sports. I mean, we do have some advantage, which is we practice sports. And when you when you think about like the rest of your life, we don't practice most things that we do, right? We just go and do them. Like, when I, don't, I don't practice writing and then try and write a story. I just write a story. Yeah. So, you know, at least we have some, something that's separated from the performance aspect. Um, but we aren't very smart about it. A couple of things, since we were talking about basketball, and yeah. there's at least some basketball players. Like, if you learn how to shoot free throws and you practice free throws in practice, it's probably the coach blows a whistle and everybody lines up and shoots free throws and you sort of rotate around the key, right? Yeah. That's not how you shoot free throws in a basketball game. In a basketball game, you get fouled when you're running around and your heart rate's elevated, yeah. and then you shoot two, maybe three. Yeah. So why on earth are you standing there shooting 100 in a row? You'll never, ever do that when it actually matters. So, so motor skill learning, which is a thing, um, talks about random practice. That, that The best way to, to practice is to simulate as close as possible to the competitive environment because that's what you actually need to do. So um, Peter Vint, who works at the USSC, works with some NBA teams, and they now practice free throws just like that. Like they're doing a drill or they're doing something else, and the coach will grab a player, and he'll go and shoot two free throws and go back to the drill like, yeah, yeah. because that's how you do it. Yeah, like, yeah. It's game, simulating real game conditions. The, ga- the game teaches the game is what yeah. one, um, yep. one motor skill learning person yeah, okay. So uh, the, the example, the, the examples I, I love probably most in here were foot, the football examples too, both the, the small team football and sure. the players. But and then the special tool that's helping people with their cognitive football IQ. Oh yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I should remember what I wrote about. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> made an impression on me. But yeah, 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 no, yeah, it's, it's uh, so so two things again on skill acquisition. Yeah. Um, the, the term is small-sided games. So um, basketball gets one-on-one. Playing one-on-one in basketball is really useful. You learn skills that you can apply in a game. Um, very few team sports have one-on-one being useful. Beach volleyball is yep. two-on-two game. Two on two. Um, 
what's happened in football recently, especially Texas, has been sort of the epicenter of this is seven on seven football is um, these tournaments, and it's mostly during the summer. Uh, it's kind of flag football-ish, but basically quarterbacks will throw 60, 70 passes a game. There's only so many receivers. And it's just tons and tons of reps and tons and tons of seam defenses, and it's tons and tons of catching and throwing footballs. And many more than you would get in, like in, a in, season. in regular <laughs> practice. Yeah, yeah. Um, soccer has its own version of it called uh, futsal, yep. which um, is incredibly popular in Brazil. And, and, and uh, Dan Coyle wrote about this in his book. It's, it, the other tool is Madden. Um, so for all you gamers out there. For all you gamers out there. <laughs> so, so EA, where I worked briefly. Yeah. The average 12-year-old Madden fanatic has seen more professional football plays develop visually than probably a pro football Hall of Famer in the 60s did. I mean, if you think about it, if you think about how many, you know, if you play Madden really religiously, play three games a night for you know, half yeah. a year, that's a lot of pattern recognition. And, and it takes away one of the huge problems with football, which is concussions and your body getting destroyed as you try and play it. So it, it's perhaps not surprising that we have this generation of kids running super crazy sophisticated offenses that used to only be run at the pro level or not even at the pro level, that, that require a lot of quick decision making by the quarterback. So the read option totally depends on the quarterback seeing the defense and basically reading one or two things that happen. Yeah. You know, that used to be like cutting edge stuff. Now like Piedmont High School's running it. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. it's it's crazy. And I and I really think that a lot of that comes down to having seen so much and, yeah. and being able to have those those visual yeah. patterns. It's a simulator. It's, it's they a they great, do it for it, flying planes. They so do it yeah, for yeah, flying yeah. planes. You know, uh, EA's genius is that, that people pay them for it. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. and, um, but yeah, it's they do it for flying planes. They do it for doctors. And you know, yeah. I think you've actually started to see some of that. There was a play a couple of years ago. So does anybody here play Madden? Thank you. Yeah, be proud. Come on, Come keep on. them up. Keep there them up. There we go. <laughs> okay, yeah. It's, uh... Okay, so anybody who plays Madden knows what I'm talking about, which is sometimes if time is running out and you're like streaking down the field and you, you've broken away from everyone, you're going to waste as much time as possible. So you get to the goal line, you sort of run across the goal line before you score a touchdown because you don't want your opponent to get the ball back. Sounds like Deshaun Jackson, but I'll leave that alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so two years ago, Eric Decker, who at the time was playing for the Broncos, did that in an NFL game. He got to the goal line and he ran. And, and it's the sort of thing that anybody who ever played Madden is like, oh, yeah, I totally know what he's doing. Like, if you watch the tape of the game, the commentator's like, what is he doing? You know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, well, he's just he's taking time off the clock. Yeah, of yeah, course yeah, he's yeah, doing yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and somebody asked him after the game, like, Madden, he's like, oh, yeah, Madden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, when you have that, I mean, that's an amazing, like, the simulation Durani, of. Durrani, if you'd only known. <laughs> this this simulation of the sport has fed back into the sport itself. It's kind of it, it, it's interesting. But by the way, a couple of the quarterbacks you mentioned from the Texas Small Football League in the last couple of years, Luck, Tannehill, yeah. RG three, RG three, yeah, yeah. Just, just a I few. Mean, just, yeah. Yeah, just, guys who yeah. who grew up in this sort of playing these tournaments where you know they play six games on a weekend and throw three hundred yeah. passes. All right, staying with the physical, um, uh, we're in the shadow of Stanford. That study on sleep was the most interesting. I love that study. So Sherry Ma is a researcher down the hill at Stanford. Um, we all know sleep. We all intellectually know sleep's important. We also know that culturally, or I would suggest that culturally, we have a really messed up attitude towards sleep. Like the braggadocio is about how little we sleep, and it's crazy. Um, because sleep, it's not just a performance maintainer, it's a performance enhancer. And that was the study that Sherry did. She worked with the men's basketball team. She took baseline sort of performance measurements, how they shot free throws, sprint tests, three-point shooting. There's one other. On their sort of normal sleep, they were sleeping. They were reporting seven hours of sleep. They were really asleep like five and a half hours. And then she challenged them to sleep as much as they possibly could. And they, they started reporting 10. It was really more like nine. Um, every member of the team ran faster. Every member of the team shot free throws better. Every member of the team shot three-pointers better. 
uh, not. So let's abandon that study now. And yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I'm going to the game tonight. As well. we'll see see if they slept. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yes, it's time to rest. <laughs> so I mean, I mean it, and these weren't small. They weren't small. Improvements. But these were like 10, 15 percent improvements. Yeah. Did the Giants try to do the same thing in the playoffs where they didn't? So the Giants have been, and I write about this. They they've really looked at this. Most teams over the course of the season, their plate discipline decreases. Teams will swing at worse pitches over the course of the year. The Giants. So I don't have data for twenty fourteen. In twenty twelve. The Giants' plate discipline got better over the course of the season. They really have focused on that. So several other teams have hired sleep consultants and, and done some work on that, but the Giants have really. So uh, speaking of sleep and getting tired, you talk a little bit about uh, athletes who are working to train their brain to, to, uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, be, being able to perform longer. So for most of the history of exercise physiology, we've thought of we like I'm a sports scientist. Um, <laughs> sports scientist. I do play one in it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I play one in a chair. Um, <laughs> fatigue was thought of as something that happened at the muscular, muscular level. Um, peripheral fatigue is the science-y term for it. So, like, you know, I'm, I'm doing bench presses, and eventually my muscles say, like, that's it. Like, there's always been argument about what's that mechanism. Yeah. Is it the buildup of lactic acid? Is it, like, I run out of fuel in the muscle? But... But the muscle says, I'm done, and it's done. Um, the latest research is that that's probably not true. Because at that moment that I can't do that last rep, only 40% of the muscle fibers in that muscle are firing. My brain isn't recruiting everything that it could. And so why not? Um, there are some slightly different theories, but the general idea is that the brain sort of has this idea of what it's going to let my body do. Like if I set out to run 5K, before I take a stride, my brain knows how fast it's going to let me run because its job is to get me to the end of the 5K, yeah. not to let me run faster. It just wants to, it wants to preserve me, right? So if I start out running 5K and halfway through, you pull up next to me in your car, it's like, hey, we're going to run 10K today, actually. Yeah. First of all, I'll slow down subconsciously. Right, right. But second of all, I'll still run that 10K faster than I would have if I started off and you yeah. as knowing I was going to run 10K. Right. My, my, there's potential there that's, un yep. that's untapped. So Sam Markara is a researcher in Wales who's working with UK sport and also the British military to see if through brain training exercises during physical exercise, can you get the brain to basically fatigue less during exercise and allow your body to do more? And he such a classic thing. He's like, I'll tell you in 2016 after the Olympics if it works. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, there, there were the one example, the female observer, <laughs> which you, you know where this is going. Um, social psych experiments are so amazing, right? So you, 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 all of these research projects take place on college campuses with something like 15 well-trained male students were brought in to run on a treadmill, and they'd run and um, there were two conditions. One, there was a, a male person monitoring. In one condition, a male associate would come in and talk to that person. And in the other condition, a attractive female associate would come in and talk to that person. And every single man ran faster when the attract. <laughs> <laughs> We, our brains are, you know, for, for all that's amazing about our brains, yeah. we're so easily manipulated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, no, we're these, so easily manipulated. If you tell me, if you, some of these deception studies, if you tell me it's a certain temperature in the room, yeah. even if it's not, if you tell yeah. me it's really hot, I'll go slower. If you tell me, even if it is hot, if you tell me it's not, I'll go faster. Yeah, oh, which is wild. And then uh, uh, caffeine. Caffeine's a great drug. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, I mean, not just for waking up, but um, for almost every athlete, um, the, the studies are really consistent that caffeine works. Yeah, no, which, which is great. Um, data, <laughs> data, that's why I drink, like, data analysis in sports. Dorkapalooza. Dorkapalooza. Uh, the, that's, so Bill Simmons is a sports writer for uh, Grantland.com now. Um, he, he dubbed, that's the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. There. Which is supposed to be just really cool. Oh, it's awesome. Yeah. It's fun. Um, 
it's uh, 2,000 data nerds talking about sports. So um, what's cool about it and what's interesting about it, and, and we all sort of deal with this more than perhaps a lot of people, is the boom in data collection has really caused this problem for, for our sports organizations and athletes, which is it used to be really hard to get the information. Now it's really easy to get the information. The, the trick now is analyzing the information. What do you do with it? And, and especially when you start talking about data sets like um, SportView, which is a, a system in the NBA that captures three-dimensional positional data on every player and the ball and officials 25 times a second during a game. Every player, every game. Every player, every game. Yep. Every team. Every team. Yep. 25 times a second. Yeah. Like, that's not, that's not, you know, Bill James could sort of revolutionize baseball stats when he was a night watchman at a yeah. pork and beans factory in Kansas yeah. because he could do the math. Like, yeah. to crunch those numbers, you need a data scientist. You need, you need people who are used to, like, crazy big data sets, and most franchises, frankly, have no idea what to do with this. So, um, so, so we've met with at least two companies that are in, taking NBA data and, and processing it. And, right. and it's unbelievably interesting because, first of all, they have to make the data into the players moving. Right. And then once they have specific players moving the ball, they can then just start crunching tendencies. Okay, if you push LeBron left on the wing... He, his shooting percentage goes from 62 to 30. And, right. And right. You want LeBron moving left. You want Kobe to shoot from the left baseline, not the right baseline. Yeah. So let's start funneling him that way. The, the granular information, I, I write about Kirk Goldsberry, who um, is a Harvard cartologist. Yes. Sorry. Okay. I thought I said cardiologist for a yeah. second, which is totally different. Yes, Cart yeah. <laughs> uh, cartographer <laughs> is what Kirk is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he, uh, he got... He started actually by scraping data from ESPN's website before SportView existed. And he was basically just getting shot data for every player where they took every shot, whether they made it or missed it, yeah. and then start mapping it. And it's like, what's the expected value of a shot here versus a shot there? And you see the game changing with these insights. So many teams are running offenses now based around, you know, the three-pointer's a great shot. Yeah. So you see really advanced organizations. The, the Warriors have really worked on this. Spurs. Houston, yeah. Spurs. Yeah. Three-pointers, or I want to be at the rim. Mid-range yeah. jump shot's a bad shot. It was used. Unless you're Dirk. Yeah, then some of the stuff, I mean, it's just, you know, high pick and roll, uh, how do you play it? And so they can tell you, oh, you the guy goes over, yeah. you know, this has a 39, so the guy goes under, this has, and it's just you can wild. See over -under, with you which can players. See over under with which players, yeah, yeah. with which defensive combination. Yeah. It's, you know, we're so at the infancy of this yeah. movement, because you know, baseball, again, is where the starting. Baseball is easy because it's yeah. state-based. Yep. It's very discreet moments. Basketball is continually yeah. moving and fluid. Soccer, football, hockey. I mean, those yep. team sports, there's, there's a lot to yeah, do. Yeah, they're happening this in soccer, too. Cheating. So uh, this Dr. Bob Goldman's question is is somewhat in provocative. The Goldman dilemma is what, so Bob was a, uh, he started doing this questionnaire with athletes asking them if you could take a drug that would guarantee you an Olympic gold medal but you would die in five years would you take it and crazy percentages said yes like 80 90 percent said yes um, which is really hard to it does uh, explain biking it, it, it does explain it as, the age of the so they were competitive international athletes, so they were in their 20s, right? Um, what's interesting is, so that he started doing this in the 80s. Uh, he had had a friend who died of a steroid overdose, and he started writing all of this stuff about the scourge and danger of steroids. Um, oddly, he has become an advocate for life extension and human growth hormone, and he's sort of come in this weird full circle place. Yeah. Um, so those results stayed pretty consistent over time until about five years ago. And people have continued asking this question. And the percentage has dropped pretty precipitously, um, which is good news. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think, I think we see it for a couple of reasons. It's, it's always hard for testing to keep pace with potential cheating. But I think we're getting better, um, especially as a cyclist. Um, it's called the biological passport. So instead of trying to catch you and identify a substance in your blood. 
I'm going to test you at regular intervals, and I'm going to see what your red blood cell count is. And if there are spikes, if there's weirdness, I don't have to right. show, oh, you took something. I can just show, like, this is abnormal. Yep. Um, and that's really changed cycling. I think the culture has really changed in a lot of sports over the past few years. I think all the revelations in cycling finally sort of broke that culture of silence around yeah, the it. the Tyler Hamilton book's unbelievable. The Tyler Hamilton book is insane. Uh, I mean, it's if you haven't read it, you sh care about this stuff. It's an amazing, heartfelt, devastating book about choices that he felt like he had to make. Had to make it. Um, so I'm, you, you know, I, it's really easy to make really extreme arguments on doping. And yeah. I've made some of them in the past, like, oh, just... Any, let anybody do anything, yeah. because at least you can be sort of internally consistent. In, in sort of thinking about it more and talking to people, um, you know, to argue by analogy, which is a terrible way to argue, but that would be like saying, like, if somebody gets away with murder, well, then we should just make murder legal. It's okay, yeah. right? Part of it is because sports are arbitrary. There's no reason we have to do any of this. So it, we feel it, there's obviously a moral difference between cheating in a sport and killing someone. But it's also this, um, you're not trying, it's not about catching the cheat. It's about protecting the ability of the clean athlete to be competitive. I shouldn't have to make that choice to be competitive. Yeah, yeah. And so whatever we can do to protect that ability, I think, is worth doing. And, and, uh, go for it. Why beet juice and caffeine? Why are they okay? It's a really good question. I mean, and, and the answer is because we decided that they are. So... It, but it's all arbitrary, right? It could be 92 feet to first base or 85 feet to first base. Red blood cells is just another example of that, right? So we're totally cool with people living at altitude because we don't feel like we should let people. Okay, so okay, so how about a hypoxic tent? If I spend 15 grand, I can build a room in our house, and Kristen might not like living at altitude every night, but like. <laughs> We, we can sit there and be... You, you may be in the tent by yourself, yeah, we big can, guy. So we can be so, light, uh, yeah. slightly yeah. lightheaded and generate more red blood cells. Or I can blood dope. I can take my own blood out and spin out the red blood cells and put them back in. Or, so I'm doing this in what I think is the order of badness. Or I can blood dope with somebody else's blood, which is, that's detectable at least. Or I can take EPO. They all have the same effect on my same body. Mechanism. The, yeah, the, yeah. The, the same outcome. Yeah. Different degrees of yep. the same outcome, but the same outcome. And we're okay with some when we're not with others. The World Anti-Doping Agency actually looked into banning altitude tents. And, and they had that conversation for a long time. And in talking to some of these altitude researchers, one thing that came up was like, look, if you're going to ban an altitude tent, you're going to have to ban Gatorade. And, and so the answer, I mean, the answer is it is all arbitrary. But we sort of decide... I, th I think part of it goes to risks, like physical risks. There, there are no physical risks to too much beet juice. There's some to caffeine, but you really have to work at it. Um, you know, there are profound physical risks to EPO. And so I think that's part of it. I think part of it is accessibility of the technology to, to a broad swath of people. So, you know, everybody can sort of source beet juice, event, unless you're in London in 2012. Um, so I think those are some of the some of the factors that feed into that. But it is at the end of the day, it's just we it's we decide on a set of rules and ask everybody to follow them. I, I had a mini version of this. I was uh, this summer spent three straight weeks in the mountains biking. Came back and my time improved by came like back and you eight, eight nine people. percent. Yeah, and it was just because I I have these you know these sparkers. I'm just like oh my god. It's yeah. yeah. I mean yeah. You know, it does help to have more red blood cells on it, the bike. It's, it was it was pretty good. So the past century has seen this massive improvement, but in many sports it, the rate is slowing down. In some cases, sports haven't even gotten back to the blood to the cheated records and things like yeah, that. Yeah, well, I mean... So, you know, are, are we reaching our natural limits? Uh, yes and or no but. Um, mm -hmm. in, in some ways, we are. I mean, in, in the, I mean, just for the mathematicians, the curve's flattening out, right? It's, it, our improvement is slowing. It's not stopping. You know, logically, you come to a point where you think you, there has to be a limit, but... Um, one of the people I was talking to for the book, his name's Andy Walsh. She runs Red Bull, actually runs this giant high-performance athletic program. They sponsor hundreds of athletes around the world. Were we talking about caffeine before? Or is <laughs> it, yeah, <laughs> sorry. It's, uh... um, 
And I was talking to Andy Walsh, is his name. He came from, uh, he's Australian and worked with the US ski team. I'm like, well, nobody's ever going to run 100 meters in eight seconds. He's like, why not? I'm like, well, because you, you can't. He's like, well, so think of Neanderthal man and think of where we are now and think of that level of improvement. And he's like, and, and just start to project that forward, right? And he's like, evolution hypothesis. Evolution hypothesis, yeah. right? That, and so, he, so his line was, you know, somebody will run 100 meters in six seconds, and he just won't look anything like what we think human beings look like today. Like you're saying Bolt, yeah. yeah exactly. I mean, yeah. but Bolt's a great example, right? Like, every artist thought sh sprinters had to be short. Yeah. Turns yeah. out they don't. They don't, yeah. Which is good. What, I'm going to ask, open up to questions after this, so be thinking. Um, what, what, what interesting trends are you looking, seeing now that you think have, you know, that, that are worth watching go forward? I mean, I keep coming back to just, we're actually really far behind in the U.S. on a lot of this. And, and so seeing some of the things that have happened in Australia and the UK make their way into major US team sports, I think we're going to see a lot of changes in yeah. NBA, NFL. You haven't mentioned that what Australia is doing. That, I, that, that came up in the book repeatedly. Yeah, I mean, it's Australia really, so a lot of this really started in the 70s and 80s in Eastern Bloc countries. Um, and then Australia, after the 76 Olympics, founded the Australian Institute of Sport. And they really drove a ton of innovation um, to and through the 2000 Games at Sydney. Um, companies have come out of that. There's a company called Catapult, some of you might be familiar with. Um, they make a little GPS. They, they make a little sensor units. GPS, accelerometer, gyros, it's like 20 sensors. And it sits sort of in between your shoulder blades. Um, not that anybody else is watching Australian sports, but if you do, sometimes you'll see like rugby players with this little like thing protruding between their shoulders, and they have a little pocket where it's sewn in. Um, they're using that data in real time. So coaches are making decisions on substitution patterns based on what they're seeing from the data. So not like, not like Jeff, how do you feel? But like, oh, Jeff's initial 10-yard sprint time has gone down 10%. He needs a break because he's not able to cover this winger with that so we're, speed. So we're two minutes into the game. We're two minutes yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, The game has just started. Um, um, you know, so literally they're sitting there with an app that's suggesting here's the load that a player has undergone and here's what we should do with and, it. And here's the impact. The World Cup said he's run six miles, but right. it doesn't say how the speed has exactly. changed over the six miles. So none of the U.S. <clears throat> team sports has allowed any of that yet. Um, some of the biggest pushback is from the players' unions. Because now I can evaluate. Oh, many of them are using them in practice. So regulation, again, limiting technology. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not that that's, is that a thing down here? <laughs> nah. <laughs> um, so I, I think, but I, the advantages far outweigh the disadvantages. And eventually they'll come to an understanding yeah. with the unions. But they're worried that they're going to, like, your next contract time, it's going to be like, yes, but, you yeah. know, look. Here's the data. It's so. all, the, all the concussion uh, technology that's, we've, we've seen 20 different concussion approaches to concussion right. management, right. and the players union's like, uh-uh. Yeah. Yeah, stay away, yeah. It's just, which is interesting. Uh, questions? Yeah, Mark. Um, I'm curious what your comments are. Uh, players are getting bigger, too, it seems, right? Mentioning Dirk and LeBron, Durant, or tight ends in football. Yeah. Is that, is that uh, bigger people entering sports? I think, I think we are, um, David Epstein, who wrote another great book about sports science last year called The Sports Gene, um, talked about it as the big bang of body types. Um, it used to be, um, there are these amazing studies um, on um, morphology done over the course of the Olympic Games, like people literally going in and like taking measurements of Olympic athletes. And in the 20s, that range was very small. Like if you plotted height, weight, it was a pretty small range in every sport. Now today, it's like this. It's so atomized. So I think part of it is just increased training proficiency. I think a big part of it is better nutrition worldwide, just getting people to, to sort of fulfill their genetic potential physically. Um, and, and part of it is I think every sport has sort of pushed to some of the extremes of that morphology um, just because the competitive landscape drive, you can't be competitive anymore as, again, you, you watch those now 60s NFL games, like the offensive linemen, like the huge guys on the field are the size of like 
The tailbacks. Not even, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, like, like 6'2", 230 was like a big guy back then, and that's not a big guy anymore in the NFL. Did you, do you have a question? I always thought, thought you raised your hand, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'm actually, so I'm very interested in wearables right now, as are a lot of people. And I'm curious, oh, no, that's okay. I'll be loud. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm curious uh, whether or not you think that this sort of consumer revolution in wearable technology is um, sort of adequate, an adequate slice of what we're seeing professionals do with technology. Because it's being marketed as that. No, it's being marketed it, as, yeah. you know, measure your sleep with your wristband and then. But here we have, you know, professionals guiding um, I think most of the stuff on the market right now is still fundamentally a toy and a hobby. I mean, it's, <coughs> they're going to be these steps. And, but to get really good data, the sensors are bigger and more annoying and bulkier right now. Or to have something that looks okay to wear, they're smaller and the data is not as good, right? So... So we're a long way. I mean, I think just I think they're better than nothing. I think capturing information is always better than not capturing information. But nobody at the professional level is relying on a tool like Fitbit or Up or Fuel Band. Gerald. <laughs> I think we'll see that tomorrow morning. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. I think those are huge questions. I think that's why the players' unions are really pushing back on this, right? I mean, it, there, there's so little privacy for a professional athlete anyway that um, that they're worried about that. You know, the teams that are excuse me, using that stuff now, mostly you're using them for practices and not sort of 24-7. But, yeah, once I sign you to an $80, $100 million contract, am I going to want to know everything about your life? I probably am. And that's, that's a tough negotiation, I think. Yeah. We have a great example of extreme uh, performance in sports here recently. Madison Bumgarner, Oof. seven in the World Series. Like, we haven't seen a performance like that in 100 years, if, 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 if ever. ever. What do you attribute that to? It's, I, I mean, I can't attribute it to anything other than, like, that's why we watch sports, right? We watch sports to see, like, if you watch sports really, really carefully, every game you will see something you've never seen before. And every, every game will offer you a moment of, oh, my God, did that just happen? And it can be as small as a crossover move, it can be as large as Bumgarner coming out and throwing 70-some pitches on two days rest to say, I mean, it's crazy what he did, right? It's, it's nuts. And, and that's, that's why it's not academic. That's why we cheer and yell and jump up and down and don't just hand in a spreadsheet at the start and say, I trained more and here's my physiology and so I'm better. Like there's, there's uh, you know, right? I mean, that's like if you take the 10,000 hours thing to its reductionist, most absurd point, there would be no point of running a race. Just show me your training log, and I'll tell That's you who's going to win. That's why they play the game. That is, Sorry, yeah, right? Exactly. And and you get it's so hard to answer. Did not yeah. sound super cliche as you yeah. say this, but like that's that's, that's why we Berman. care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, otherwise it's just it's, it's yeah. just this thing that happens. What are your thoughts on on uh, anti aging programs like Cenogenics? <sighs> I, I I will be honest that I don't know a super ton about them, so I, I don't want to speak terribly authoritatively. I mean, I, there's some really interesting research on, on sort of ways to keep the ongoing genetic damage that we all suffer as our cells replicate over time to, to lessen that through different interventions and that sort of telomere decay that we all have. Um, exercise is one thing that shows that. Like, a lot of times people are like, oh, professional athletes don't live that long. And there are certainly cases that we can point to and tragic cases, but but generally as a population, elite athletes do live longer than the rest of us, even with what their bodies have been th put through. So um, I can't really speak to any specifics on a specific plan. But The reason I mention it is, is I did this race uh, in October with this Grand Fondo. Uh, pretty brutal race, 9400 feet of climb, 102 miles. 
Which which one? Uh, Levi's. Oh, okay. So Coleman Valley Road and all the fun up there. That, that was actually easy part. Yeah. Um, but the gentleman who had competed is 18 years older than, than me. Mm -hmm. Was able to you know keep pace with me the entire time. Performed quite well. I found out later on he was on this sedative program, which is administered by medical physicians. Right. It's a lot of data sampling, DNA testing. Um, you know, there are things like human growth hormone and testosterone that are administered, but done so legally. His performance was amazing. I mean, look, HGNH and testosterone freaking work. I mean, there's no doubt that, that those anabolic agents are incredibly powerful. They're legal, under, you know, they're legal prescribed by a physician and not in a competitive environment. So yeah, in that case, you can do that. You know, we haven't really talked about personalization, but that's one thing. It's like that testing in everything from nutrition to training programs, we're like, oh yeah, yeah, we're all different. We're all individuals, but it's, we are crazily so. Some, you know, so the population in this room, 65 or 70, if, there are five of us in this room, likely, who are very low responders to aerobic exercise, like who can only see less than 5% improvement to our VO2 max through whatever we do forever. And there are likely five of us who are incredibly high responders to aerobic exercise, 20 plus percent gain to VO2 max. That, that's a huge delta in, in a really small population. So. You know, we know this intuitively. Two of us go on the same training program and have very different results. And the reason is genetic. Yeah. So my wife is German-American, and we've had many discussions over soccer. Um, okay. I have this theory that the U.S. soccer program is not better because our best athletes don't play soccer. Yep. What's your take on that? You're right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not that we're behind. We can just get our best athletes to play. I mean, we... Yeah, I mean, to, 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 to a large extent, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's, you should, yeah, yeah, I'll give her a ring after. When we're, when we're having drinks, give me the phone. I'll tell her you're totally right. Um, you know, we're starting, it's going to be interesting, right? Like, there are two facets. One is obviously the athletes, and our best athletes don't play soccer. Um, more and more are, I think. I think in 10 years, like, I'd be short NFL right now if I were a betting man because I, I think we're going to start taking a harder and harder look at the consequences of playing American football. Um, yeah, th 30 years ago, boxing was one of the top three sports. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think we'll start to see some of those athletes shift. I, I think... Obviously, we know all the youth participation numbers in soccer. That's, that's never really translated to anything at the world stage. We're getting better. Klinsman's actually great because what Klinsman's actually worked on is not at the elite level, but trying to build the infrastructure. He's a, he's a German. He's a German. I just thought yeah, I'd I point that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but, but he's trying to build... Yeah. You know, he's trying to build the system. Yeah. Part of it is identifying those athletes and making sure that they're starting to play and getting them into the system. You know, discoverability of a great athlete is in a country our size is a problem. Just a couple more questions. Thank so the um, question I had was around to what extent does you know everything that you've seen uh, on this topic lead to a general slippery slope towards just straight up genetic intervention? And you know, if we are going to get faster, stronger, whatever, where does it end? And do we eventually get there? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's um so near the end of the book, the, the last chapter is on the limits of performance. And um, Mark Denny, who's another Stanford guy, um, wrote this kind of amazing paper looking at the rates of improvement in, in three sports, human track and field, thoroughbred horse racing, greyhound racing. Um, obviously, we're very comfortable running a straight up genetics breeding program for speed in horses and, and dogs. Um, those sports have plateaued. Like, Horses haven't gotten any faster since the 70s, statistically. I mean, there you get some variation. Um, same with greyhound racing. Um, I am so massively unqualified to have a medical ethics discussion about sort of how we'll get to sort of genetic modifications for these things. I guess I would just caution that that the idea that there are easy genetic answers to these questions, you know, height, we know height to be... 60% genetically determined, roughly, 70, between 60 and 70. Um, so that's easy to know. 
what the specific alleles are, what the SNPs are, a single, oh, sorry, um, that's impossible. And there's something on the order of 30,000 that have been identified that have some association, right? So, so we can know that there, are, that there are genetic factors against these things. Our ability to even begin to touch or modify those factors today, you know, of course, today is, is non-existent. Um, I, yeah, God only knows where we'll end up. In, your, in the book, the odds of playing in the NBA go up massively with each inch. So if you're, <laughs> if you're seven feet tall, so first of all, there, being seven feet tall is really, really crazily super rare. But if you're a, a seven foot tall American male, you have roughly a 25% chance of playing in the National Basketball Association. If you are 6'6", six, six, which again, is really tall, you have like a 0.2% chance of playing in the NBA. Like that, that's how steep that curve gets at the, at the bottom, right? So, and if you're 6'1", sorry. If you're 6'1", I, you're, you're, <laughs> I mean, how, how are you moving to the left, right? 6'1 and over 50. Anything yeah. in the back, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah it's, yeah, All day uh, long, yeah, you yeah. know. Hey, what, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Use sports. Yes. So, Focus on travel team specialization. Please don't. Any correlation at all? No, it's with injury. High correlation with injury and negative correlation with elite success later in life is the short answer. The, the slightly longer answer is th this is one of the real scourges of 10,000 hours, right? Is this idea that I, I need my kid to pick a sport early and really practice it hard. It can work, right? But Eric Hyden. Eric Hyden. But Tiger Woods, you know, like, right, Re read, there, there, there's, wait, your, wait. there's your cautionary tale, right? <laughs> <laughs> but like, but read Just Agassi, a wall, read a Agassi's bit. autobiography on how he felt about tennis, you know, most, there's actually been good research on this, most Olympic athletes specialize late, you have a much better chance of finding a sport, A, that you enjoy playing, which f fundamentally is really what we should all be focused on, because statistically none, you know, it's a rounding error if you're an elite. The other part is you, you get a better match between your body and the sport. Like, you know, I grew up as a cyclist. Maybe I would have been a great soccer player. I don't know. I never played soccer. I, that sampling period is really important. So, so please, yeah. That's fine. Great. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.